Hello and welcome to Villiers Park's second in a series of events looking at effective partnerships between schools, universities, FE colleges and third sector organisations. I'm absolutely delighted to see that people have come back um, to discuss this in, in more detail with us. We've got a really interesting panel who I think we'll be able to gain a lot of insights and wisdom from and um, pepper with useful questions about how things work from, from their perspectives. I think I have actually, looking at the list of participants, met most of you um, previously, but if not, I'm Ray Tooth. I'm the Chief Executive here at Villiers Park and it's really lovely to meet you. I'm going to hand over to Julian in a moment to talk through what kind of how we've ended up, where, where we are today, um, and then and then we'll come back to me for a conversation with our fantastic panel before we break up into into workshops so that we can do a little bit more of that detailed thinking and really hear about what it is that, that you're able to share with us. Um, after this event, there's going to be a third event which will involve um, John Blake, the Director of Fair Access and Participation, and probably, but not definitely confirmed yet, Ofsted, looking at how we make these partnerships work from a policy level. So that means we'll have been through a journey of looking at practitioners, at organisations, and then at policymakers to ensure that we really are able to hear each other in terms of what it is that we need to build successful partnerships and what it is that we're really able to offer in, into those partnerships. And from those conversations, we're looking to build a framework um, that will be available to anybody who needs it uh, to help us to navigate those relationships, which I think everybody agrees are really valuable when they work, really transformational when they work for the young people that we look to support. And everybody also agrees are really bloody tricky to set up effectively. And so it's how do we help ourselves? How do we work together to make sure we can navigate and establish really effective relationships? Because we're all aligned in terms of the outcome that we want to achieve, which is fantastic outcomes for the young people that we work with. OK, I'm going to head over, head over hand over to Julian, uh, who's going to talk to you in a bit more detail about where we're at at the moment. Uh, thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, so um, my part of the session today, I guess, is, is kind of developing some work that we started in the, uh, the first of these workshops uh, last month, this month. I can't remember um, when we we crowdsourced some thinking from different parts of the sector, from school sector, colleges, FE, universities, higher education, and um, third sector organisations as well, to reflect on the challenges we were all facing in terms of working effectively together across the sector. And I guess one of the things that brought that into focus was, as, as Ray said, you know, the kind of increasing focus on cross sector working. Particularly, I guess, you know, uh, most prominently from a university end and um, the Office of Students is encouraging universities to work more closely with schools and FE colleagues, um, particularly around attainment raising. Um, but also, um, I guess, uh, from a third sector perspective, we work closely with schools and universities. So we, we sort of um, see the, the, the sector landscape and we were interested in how the different parts of the sector joined up um, so what we've done is we uh, we did a, um, a kind of a jam board collaborative exercise where we asked people to talk about what they had to offer other parts of the sector and also what they wanted from different parts of the sector and that's enabled us to build a sort of framework of where wants and needs match and where those are unmatched um, so I can, I'm going to try, I always dread doing this, you know, when you share screen, it should be the easiest thing in the world, but um, here we go. So I'm going to try and share a copy. Hopefully everyone's managed to download a PDF copy. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. There we go. Uh, right. So I'm hoping that you will now see uh, the word document is that right are you, are you seeing all kinds of other bits of rubbish on my just you just seeing that yeah great so um it's actually uh gratifyingly long the framework that we've got to and, and i've um was able to broadly um divide the content into kind of three main areas so there were wants and needs and offers around content um, wants and needs and offers around the logistics and practicalities of working together and uh, as a reminder that the main focus really is 
working collaborative, collaboratively to support young people and, and particularly um, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds who, who may not have access to the same opportunities as their more advantaged peers. Um, and then finally a kind of miscellaneous, oh there, there was um, actually quite, I was quite surprised by the amount of information sharing, either requirements or offers that, that people had, um, and then a kind of miscellaneous um, thing. So I'm not going to go through the whole framework and a reminder this, this is just a work in progress this is just a first attempt to kind of pull together the discussion so far I hope we will have time later to kind of develop it further but it will be a kind of an open source open access document that everyone can feed into and we can modify as we go um, I'm not sure I've nailed the best way of representing it um, so I am very welcome uh, or I would very grateful for any suggestions from more design minded colleagues about how to lay this out in a way that makes sense um, but at the moment it's basically it's got the four columns for the different parts of the sector um, you've got an arrow for the um, the part of the sector who which made the point if it's a blue arrow it's um, something that they want to see if it's a green arrow it's something that another part of the sector offers and then where the two things have joined um, it's got this kind of bracket there so in the, the top two rows we've got um, our school partners said that they would like to see more bespoke and tailored programmes and activities that actually match their needs. And a uh, university colleague said that they actually offer bespoke IAG for particular student groups from particular backgrounds. So we've got the sense of, of a, a, an initial match there of, of wants and needs. Um, but for the most part, there's a kind of a lot of offers and a lot of wants, but they don't always um, coincide. So another area that we, we sort of saw a, 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 a coal, you know, sort of a matching process was um, around the logistics and practicalities of working together. Um, so the, one of the comments from school and FE partners was that um, university and third sector uh, activities didn't always align with their calendar. So there were kind of great activities that were being offered when exams were on, or when a certain cohort was out of school for re um, revising or so on. And, and then from the school sector, uh, sorry, from the university sector, we also had comments that it would really help them to work more closely with schools to understand what the school year looked like. So they could begin to actually, they could actually plan out the, the schedule in advance. They would know what was coming up. They would know when to the target stuff. And, and also um, university colleagues said that they'd like a bit more sort of clarity and transparency about when the best times to engage uh, with, with students uh, is. Um, and then another kind of point of contact was um, uh, university saying that they would welcome support uh, uh, from schools around um, tracking and monitoring students, um, checking outcomes. Um, and I, that's kind of a, a, a quite a common challenge for us all, I think. Um, but there are other universities who said that they could offer schools or potentially university partners with support with that targeting and tracking. So some people have solutions to problems. And I guess part of the, the challenge that we've now got, when we look at the kind of, um, all the kind of information and the knowledge that's needed across the sectors, how we put people who know with people who want to know what they know, if that makes sense. Um, so there's this kind of, it, what we've got is a kind of a, an overall sense so far of what we might need uh, in different parts of sectors, but we don't yet have the solutions for how we match those, those gaps. And, and we'll come back to that um, a bit later uh, on, hopefully. So I'll stop sharing uh, this now, but um, please do um, download a copy from the chat, um, take it away feedback to me or, or to Ray, any suggestions, any thoughts, um, and then we'll, we'll keep developing and, and trying to flesh out some of those, um, uh, the, the, the kind of gaps. Um, so uh, the overall at the moment, we're still represented, we're still overrepresented by HG, which is great because, you know, that's a, a part of the sector that we work with closely. Um, we did send out a survey to schools and FE to try and get more feedback from them about what they wanted from university and third sector partners. We have got some replies, um, which enabled us to kind of develop further, but I think there's still work to do in reaching out to those parts of the sector to get a, a more clarity around some of the um, things that they were um, asking for or had to offer. Um, and I think that, 
is kind of an overview. I think it's, it's probably quite a lot to take in. Um, so what I've done and what we'll come back to later is we've got a, a sort of Jamboard exercise where I've highlighted a number of areas that I think um, could do with uh, uh, heads and brains together to start thinking about what solutions might look like. And as, as with uh, this, the, the framework, we'll gather those um, those thoughts and those potential solutions, and we'll reflect them back, and then we'll work uh, uh, work out how we we put them in place and how we're able to deliver them. Um, I've got probably a, a couple a minute or two. If there's any kind of thoughts anyone's got from a very quick initial glance at the framework, um, obviously please feel free to tell me that it looks horrible um, because it does. Um, and again, any you know designers in the room, please help. Um, but any any kind of initial um, thoughts or suggestions or any glaring gaps that you've spotted in there that you think uh, we might need to fill? Please feel free just to un unmute or just throw something into the, the chat function and, and we'll pick it up. Um, which is the case as we go along, please do use the chat function to, to keep adding thoughts, uh, questions, comments, design hints, that kind of thing. Okay, in that case, we'll, we will come back to the framework after our excellent panel discussion. Um, oh, sorry, so Steve uh, has asked uh, whether he's missed the download link. Um, Steve, hopefully if you scroll up to the top of the chat, there's the, the links there. Um, but any problems accessing it, please let me know and I'll, I'll win you a copy over. Okay. Oh, oh uh, someone sent it round again. I think yeah. probably amazing. Amazing Stephen, who we can't even see, but he's really good. Just working his magic in the background. Um, so yeah, I'll, be... Sorry, go on. I'll, 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 I'll hand back to, to Ray to um, introduce our panelists. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I always love chairing because I really like getting involved in the conversation. I absolutely hate chairing because I have to do this bit at the beginning where I do my introductions. I'm not even going to try to do it properly anymore. Um, people who know me well already know that I'm very severely dyslexic. Reading and people who don't know me, you know now. So reading a list of small type of names and organisations stacked one across the other, I will muddle up all your names and your organisations and suddenly Laura will be Laura Guild uh, from Brown College or something horrific like that. So if it's okay, I'm going to be super informal and just go with first names. Um, but I don't want you to miss out on the opportunity to say more fully who you are and, and where you're from, because um, that's part of why you're here. Part of why you're here is bringing your own wisdom and expertise, but also um, the clout of the wisdom of the organisation that you are here to represent. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to very, uh, very quickly say hello to Laura and invite her to um, join our conversation and just share a few words and insights with her about the work that we've been doing so far. Laura, it is absolutely fantastic to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, Ray, and hello, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, for those of you that I, I haven't met or, or don't know of Brightside, um, Brightside uh, exists to help young people make confident, informed decisions about their future. Uh, and today I wanted to um, kind of talk to the two principles that have uh, underpinned those 20 years, which, which kind of are hopefully pertinent to this discussion. Um, so for 20 years, we've um, strived to help young people make competent informed decisions in two uh, crucial ways uh, that have not changed for 20 years. Firstly, we do it online uh, through mentoring. We connect young people with role models across the country to provide them with both social and hum human capital to enable those confident informed decisions. Uh, and secondly, we have always done that in partnership. Uh, we work with around 50 to 60 different organisations uh, a year. They can be businesses, they can be universities. We've worked with a number of people on this call before. Uh, and most recently, we've been working directly with schools in partnership. Um, so I guess at Brightside, we wholeheartedly agree with the kind of the leaning and uh, rhetoric that's coming from the OFS, which is that embedded community context really kind of supports strong partnerships. Um, and I, I thought today it would be useful to, to kind of say wh why Brightside's done that for 20 years, why we still do that, why we plan on always doing that. It's kind of one of our core values to work within in a collaborative way. Um, and I guess the first reason is the social mobility issue is huge. It's massive. 
it unfortunately, despite all of our best efforts, is not getting any easier. Um, and we recognise at Brightside that we don't know everything and we can't do everything and we can't be everywhere. Um, we're small and mighty. We work with 10,000 young people a year. Um, but the issue is massive, as per point one. Um, finally, context is crucial. So we're a national charity and, and people on this call will be uh, working in huge swathes of area across the country or, or uh, nationally as well. Um, and whilst we're experts in providing high quality mentoring, uh, we know how to provide structures and models that support young people to form impactful uh, relationships with role models online. And we have robust impact that shows us that uh, young people that have um, that, that have bright side mentoring are twice as likely to access higher education uh, than than their peers. Uh, that's really powerful. But what I don't know is the community context. We're, we're national. Uh, I don't know what additional contextual challenges a certain group of young people in a certain area going to a certain school are currently facing. And as such, I can provide my expertise but it may not support that group and it might not might not be the most powerful way of supporting that group so partnership is is crucial um and at brightside what I, I guess the guiding principles are to just lean into others expertise own your own expertise and lean into others in order to to kind of really um, build powerful um partnerships uh so that's my kind of throwing it into the mix having not been at the previous session I hope that's use useful it's more relational than um kind of great logistics of partnerships but I'm, I'm happy to cover that later on if, if needs be no, Laura that was really helpful um and and you know it speaks again of that we need to pool our wisdom where there's wisdom and we need to create spaces for people to excel at the things that they're able to do and it's that kind of pulling together those relationships um, that are absolutely key. Thank you. It's very disappointing you didn't attend our first session. I very much <laughs> hope you'll be at our last. Uh, <laughs> Carl, can I hand over hand over to you, please? Yeah, sure. Hello. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, my name is Carl Devincenti. I'm the school's relationship manager at the University of Exeter. Um, I manage the team who work across the UK. So we work nationwide, um, all the way up from Scotland, all the way down to the Channel Islands and everything else in between. So we have uh, members of uh, staff and members within my team who are spread across nationwide. Our remits are quite sort of clear in terms of reaching out to students who have the potential to succeed, um, regardless of their background. And it's very much um, reaching out to students across the UK, trying to uh, encourage students to think of both um, higher education institutions um, outside the immediate sort of circle, immediate, the immediate uh, sphere, and thinking of uh, universities such as the University of Exeter, Russell Group University, um, research-led. Now, we do this through a variety of different methods. Uh, part of it is very much raising awareness, understanding of what is out there. The other part is through longitudinal programs. Um, and we have programs that work with young uh, students um, from uh, early years through to year 12, year 13. And then we also try to do this through um, quite transparent contextual admissions um, through contextual offers that we make to students as well. So um, we make uh, sort of offers uh, considering the individual, we look at the individual, we look at uh, where they've uh, come from, uh, their educational trajectory, and we take that into account when we make offers to those students. So that kind of gives you an overview of uh, where I come from and uh, sort of the work that we do, but I'm more than happy to uh, delve deep into that and the implications of that in terms of supporting students um, through the discussion. Thank you so much, Carl. Um, it's a brilliant example of the breadth of activities that a university um, seeks to do with young people that are, that, are, that are in schools. And so there are lots of opportunities for schools to in, engage if we can just create the right environment for, for that to be able to happen. Kate, can I come on to you next? Of course. Um, hi, I'm Kate Wicklow. I'm the policy manager at Guild HE and we are the representative body of smaller and specialist universities, um, colleges and alternative providers in the sector. Um, and I suppose we 
I, from my perspective, our members probably have a, a slightly different experience to Carl in that they are small, um, so their teams need to be more kind of flight of foot and, and lead on partnerships because actually they don't have the capacity to deliver um, the type of breadth um, of, of access work that genuinely needs to happen um, for social mobility to be successful. So um, for us, I think there are many issues that span lots of different age groups. And so us working in partnership with third sector organisations and schools to, to understand what those barriers are and to kind of communicate different ways that we can um, raise attainment for, for those groups is incredibly important. But like I say, we can't do that alone. Um, so what our members generally focus on is, and actually now is a really good opportunity to, to reignite this conversation, is all of the work that's going on around levelling up, um, all the regional investment money um, that's coming from government, but also from LEPs and um, Chambers of Commerce and all those kind of things. I know they're very different in different regions, but it's a really good incentive at the moment for all education providers in that region to genuinely come together and have a conversation about what skills needs are and how we can communicate those skills needs to our future workforce, as well as the adults that are currently in the system. And I know we're talking about young people today, but actually IAG for adults is for us as important um, in leading on that agenda. And so for us to be able to deliver that, we have to work collaboratively with third sector organisations, schools, universities and colleges, because without that, we can't kind of realise the full potential of that region. But at the same time, I'm quite cognizant of the fact that many of my specialist members are highly specialist. And so they have to work both regionally and nationally in order to, to raise understandings of this, the really excellent um, but very niche professional um, employment outcomes that could exist if you went to a specialist institution and did something a little bit different so we're kind of trying to um, walk a very tight line with the resources that we have in order to do both of those things as well as we can so actually um, using other people's data and, and research and, and understanding of, of what some of the barriers are and how we can maybe change young people's perceptions of what is possible for their lives um, is always going to be um, of benefit to us um, and something that we'll always try and um, prioritise. Thanks, Kate. And insightful as ever. Um, I'm going to go to Juliet next and then David to bring us home, if that's OK. <laughs> oh, I think you're on mute, Juliet. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Sheila Horton. I'm a vice principal at Arc Alexandra down in Hastings. Um, I've been a teacher now for 25 years. Um, the majority of that experience was in, in the inner city in London. Um, and uh, 15 years of that has been in school leadership. And I'm also um, a PH finishing my PhD at UCL. So I kind of uh, go across all sectors. So, um, and what I would say is that actually the partnership that we've had, and that's partly what I'm here to talk about really is with Villiers Park has been absolutely essential um, in terms of enabling our students to be successful. So at ARC, I lead on the sixth form and teaching and learning, two really key areas if we're looking at driving social mobility. And our school does serve a very disadvantaged um, community and it has been quite a challenge and it has been even a greater challenge over the last couple of years with COVID really to build that resilience and those aspirations within our student body. Um, what has really worked with working in partnership with Villiers Park is it's been a very embedded, um, they're embedded within our school, the relationships we have built up with them are trusted and so there's been that sustained involvement and I know that they have um, work particularly effectively in the last few years with students. Um, they've built up partners, strong relationships, not only with myself as one of the leaders in school, but also with the students and with their parents. And it's been that aspect, building up that level of trust, which is often even more important to vulnerable students, that has enabled the coaching to be so effective, which happens really weekly. One student was only speaking to me a bit today at how much he really um, appreciated um, that weekly by weekly coaching those 10 minute um, drop-ins on how they are um, but it's also meant that working together we have really been able to identify the right students 
and enable and guide them to the right courses at the right universities or the right apprenticeships. And it's matching those students to the right pathways that is also really crucial. Um, I'm as a school and as part of the art network, we are highly committed to careers education. And so we do have a dedicated level six trained careers um, a leader in the school as part of our network. So we have a dedicated team of destinations that has also given kind of careers education, the priority and focus within our school development to mean that we can really support those students on those journeys. So that's kind of some of much of what else I could say, but um, I do think that the partnership has been crucial and the key aspect of it, and I know you were talking about that, Laura, is around I and our teachers know our local context, and but in terms of the Villiers Park, there's such an essential knowledge exchange because they have access to almost a national picture which can benefit our students. And the fact it's a sustained embedded partnership means that it's worked and works very well. What a ringing endorsement. Really, <laughs> really lovely to hear. I can't not mention that that was a beautiful ringing endorsement. Thank you so much, Juliet. Uh, David, um, let me in, invite you to join in the conversation. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Dave Brown. I'm the vice principal at Bexhill Sixth Form College. So we're down on the south coast, uh, probably about three and a half miles away from Hastings. So yeah. we share some of the students that will be going to Juliet's uh, schools who may make the progression to us, um, similar catchment area. So we have around a third of our students who are on the 16 to 19 bursary. So they are needing financial support, which gives an indication of the sort of local context and the challenges that those students will um, have to overcome. And I think there's, there's kind of two, thing, two things for the, from my perspective. It was interesting to talk about identifying the skills needs um, in local areas. And I think that is really, really important. But what goes alongside that is obviously the aspiration of the young people to actually complete the education and training to take up those uh, positions that we need them to do and that, that fundamentally for me is that is the biggest challenge and I don't think it's a challenge that schools and colleges can meet on their own they have to work with universities they have to work with uh, the employability the employment sector uh, because they just simply cannot provide the opportunities and as reflecting we've been involved with Villiers Park for 10 years and thinking of some of the students that have been on the program and it is all about that that spark for that student that thing that that happens it could be a master class it could be a, a residential it could be a mentoring session uh, something that we can't necessarily offer to all of our learners that actually but does make a difference for those students on the Villiers Park program and I think it's working with universities to see how we can broaden that offer that we could make more of that available and um, my background is sport I came down to Bexhill 22 years ago as an NQT PE teacher and I didn't have a fantastic school experience myself. And one of the things that I've always recognized and, and really pushed with my students is, you know, giving them those opportunities to see what it is that they, they could do to take them to the universities, to show them that, you know, this is somewhere where you might you, you could go. This is somewhere you do belong, no matter what sort of barriers may be put in place. It is something that um, is a destination that you could go for. So really it's just, seeing how we can develop those networks and partnerships to, to provide those opportunities for all students, not just obviously those that benefit from the Villiers Park programme. Absolutely, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dave. And again, another another ringing endorsement for working in, in partnership with, with Villiers. It, it occurs to me that one of the things that I heard um, from Carl and Laura and David and Julia was this was an observation about the importance of, of longevity of a relationship relationships between organizations. So we talked a little bit about you know having um, and Carl mentioned having longitudinal programs with young people. So we might there might be an intervention that follows young people for a number of years, but we're also, I think, touching on the importance of long-term relationships, embedded relationships. Um, in part with partnerships so so making building those long-term relationships between uh, an institution or an organization um, and an, and another one and that that's part of how you create a culture where those things happen more organically and I just I just wondered um, maybe maybe um, 
Carl might have some thoughts about it, and it might be that David or Juliet have some thoughts about what it is as organisations that we need to be able to have in place to make that work. Um, because we're both talking, we're, you're all talking about being able to do that successfully. So I'm, I'm really curious about what is the thing that means that long term relationships between organisations can happen. Do you want me to, um, David, as you are still on screen, do you, do you want to wade in first or do you want a moment to think about it? Uh, no, I mean, I think things that are successful are but for students, particularly who are struggling to make any type of transition, is, is seeing that students similar to them have made that progression, you know, in the in the past. You know, one of the things that I'm sure um, Juliet does with her students and we do with our feeder schools is to is to use role, not role models for the wrong word, but you know, alumni that these are students who came from your schools, these are students who had similar challenges to you, similar school experience, and this is what they've gone on to do. And having that as a, a kind of recurring theme to embed that that program and that, you know, that established progression route to, it might be a bit to a particular university or, you know, particular uh, employer, because we, we do obviously do that as well. I think that definitely helps. But I, um, I think it's just got to be something that's very clearly set out. That's the thing about the programme with Village Park. It's a clear programme of activities. And if we could do that, that reflects obviously the needs of the schools and the college, that would be helpful. That's great. Thank you. Carl, do you want to add anything about the way in which you go about establishing those, those long-term relationships with the schools that you're working with? Certainly. Um, and David, just to pick up on that, I think we, many universities have what we call student ambassador programmes, which is very much trying to encourage that whole role model that the, that, could, that person could be me uh, response from young people to look at them and say, look, they made it, they made it through those obstacles. Um, looking at the sort of uh, broader picture in terms of engagement, I guess, um, part of and part of the struggles, you know, my job would be so much easier if uh, we were able to have access to all schools across the UK, have access to all um, easy access to schools and colleges and be able to sort of make inroads in that. Um, and part of it is the mutual understanding of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and uh, that can be quite difficult to implement and to develop an understanding amongst um, schools and colleges at times where there may be a perception of what universities are doing may be different to what our actual aims and objectives are. Um, so breaking down those barriers and trying to encourage schools and colleges to uh, sort of understand what the university mission and agenda is and that, that actually what we want is the best for students, um, regardless of who they are, regardless of their backgrounds, um, we actually want to encourage them to, um, and it's working on those aspirations, um, changing those aspirations, working on that. Um, so part of the, the difficulty here is how do we get into and knock on those doors and get into those schools and colleges in the first place um, and develop that relationship? Um, and at times we have used um, partnerships and we've used uh, sort of lots of different organisations to circumvent and try to get in to schools through those routes. Um, and that's actually generated a lot of, uh, sort of leads for us and generated uh, good relationships with those schools and colleges. So we've been able to do that in that way. But any ideas, any thoughts on that process of being able to make inroads into schools and colleges and develop that meaningful relationship um, would be really valuable for us. And go on, Juliet. No, I was saying with that, and that's brilliantly poised, Juliet. I'm sure you've got things to add, but that kind of how is it that you, that you do have bit in get an introduction into a good relationship with a school would be really interesting to explore. What I was going to say is I think that's actually where the third sector can be really useful. And I think um, that is where um, that kind of, and I, I mentioned it, but that knowledge exchange that can happen. So I can, you know, with our relationship with Villiers Park, I, I have gone back to, I said, oh, I'm interested in this or this, or oh, she wants to go to this university. And then he goes away and finds and creates those links. And I think the third um, you know with the best will in the world as school leaders we're incredibly busy and there's lots of other stuff to do but having um, a third sector that's really involved and really focused nearly on those kind of progressions can be a great way of facilitating and setting up those relationships I think. Um, I think as well in Log Liberty in schools there's something in schools about school cultures and prioritizing it as I said I think the fact that we've got a school culture that places high value on careers education you know we have a seven-year curriculum plan 
and as part of that is Villiers Park. So although um, there's been different people kind of leading on that partnership, it's always a responsibility that, okay, if that member staff leaves, then obviously someone else assumes it and there's a handover. So to keep these partnerships working, and I've worked with, done, I've led on educational business partnerships as well in the past, and it's about making them part of the structure, kind of the life of the school, ensuring that when one person's left, there's a proper handover and that it's embedded. Would be my. Yeah, that's it. That's really, really interesting. And it's that that embedding in your in the you know it's in the marrow of what the school yeah. does, um, by by the sound of it. And so maybe part of those challenges are around how do we engage with schools where it isn't in the in the marrow yeah. yet. Um, but but I think the group here are all saying that there is some kind of some real value in setting in kind of setting that up. Laura, I wondered if you wanted to kind of to come in and just talk a little bit about that that third sector role because I, I know that you do it absolutely um, brilliantly at, at Brightside and that how you become the broker um, for for between schools and other organizations or young people and and, and mentors. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think kind of leaning into to the, the points already made, it, it is around recognising what each party is is bringing. Um, so the, this kind of the school context, the access to young people, the, the kind of community context of what's going on with that school, but also... Um, we, we call we, we call it kind of co-creation and it's it's to spark that as uh Carl was talking about that kind of co what what is the common goal here uh, and I think that that's really crucial as a really really early on discussion is finding finding that common language so at brightside we essentially kind of look at what it is that universities are kind of are looking for their objectives and what our schools looking for what are their objectives uh, and we know it's kind of fair access into university we know that that schools have uh, got to report against their Gatsby benefits Benchmarks. And actually, there's such join up there that what we do is translate one into the other uh, and, and provide a kind of uh, an, an intervention that supports both of those objectives. Uh, and I think that's really kind of crucial that we find that common language between the school and the university and we lean into that language at all times so that we're all kind of talking around essentially the same problem with different words um but we recognize kind of who has that there is a lack of a power dynamic and you quickly identify what is what is this power dynamic that we might be creating and let's throw that in, out the window and who's doing what who's got who got who's got the capacity who's got the resources who's 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 going to kind of uh bring what to something that is then truly kind of partnership truly co-design and that's where you get the kind of strongest most embedded um, relationships in my experience thank you that's that's oh david did you want to come back in on that yeah i just wanted to add thing about something about progression and it's about meaningful progressions i think that's where when we're talking about having a common aim because you know maybe 10 15 years ago it'd be well this percentage of students go off to university and you know that's considered a success which you know to a certain extent it is but i think the way that policy is going it's very much about well those students are going to university but what are they then going to do you know the, the new inspection framework inspection but the tweaks the inspection framework are being very much about conversation with students well you know what are you doing now how is that helping you in the future if you're going to go to university what are you going to do after university you know if you're doing a t level where you're going to go where are you going to go with that so i i think that that hopefully gives it gives a context that people can all work towards is that well it's not just about progression to the next stage of education it's about a meaningful progression that is is linked to something that the student can kind of see as, a, as an aspiration for the future Thank, thanks david and that's a really nice kind of it's that bringing in the we're not interested in just getting bums on seats it's about being really considered it's that nuance of how do you find the right fit for somebody that meets their aspirations and doesn't send them down, kind of send them down a, a blind alleyway um, into and blind alleyways are funny things, aren't they? Because they can be all sorts of things. I often think there are a number of kids who are very unhappy doing medicine and become really miserable doctors because there was a lot of pressure on them to follow that pathway because it has a particular esteem about it. And, and really success, I think, is about making sure that people have the opportunity to consider what it is that they really want to do and what, what success feels like, like for them, that they have agency over that. Um, 
Kate, I just wanted to come to you with your, you have such great insights into a kind of a breadth of institutions that you work with. And you mentioned very briefly in your introduction, um, the challenge of internal resources in, in small institutions looking to build partnerships. Um, and I just, I was just curious to understand a bit more about the kind of how, what, what resources you think are needed to make those useful, to make effective relationships. Because one of the things that we're talking about, kind of when you get down to brass tax stuff for planning in organizations, even when we're all aligned in terms of the outcomes that we want to achieve, ultimately we have to have enough you know, hands to the pump, enough people on deck to be able to build those relationships that we know are going to be be fruitful. So I and so I was really curious from I think a sector that has a fantastic understanding because of your tight resources of just how much effort it takes to build a good relationship. Whether you had kind of any insights into how you think about doing that effectively with very low levels of resource. Um, I think the most successful versions of those are ones that are embedded in an institutional wide strategy and ones that are genuinely lived as values. Um, a lot of our members are deeply rooted in the local regions that they serve and have created their curriculum portfolio in light of the fact of, of the skills needs of that area or the fact that there were not um, educational opportunities in those spaces to do higher education. A lot of our um, members are in kind of rural coastal regions or um, out of town locations. Um, so they were founded around the principles of trying to open out access to as many people as possible. So it does make it slightly easier, although they are smaller and the budgetary resources are smaller and the number of people working in the kind of WP team are smaller because it's embedded throughout the institutional strategy, it enables more people to be actively involved in those conversations and to undertake some of the delivery of that work and to work collaboratively with employers and kind of the professions that they serve. So it isn't just one person sitting in an access office talking to a school, but it might be the, the head of the creative design department who's going into schools, supporting them to understand what, um, creative skills gaps there might be in that particular school setting so it isn't just about um just kind of do trying to do everything for everybody but to really kind of be focused on on what the value of the the organization is but also the the kind of aims and objectives that you have and um, to be able to deliver something meaningful because you could just try and do everything but that just isn't possible for us it would just, I, I don't know. I mean, I just have visions of some of your specialist institutions. It's bringing together agriculture and dance. I think yeah. that you could do something phenomenal in terms of raising certainly curiosity about what, what is available in the higher education landscape. And um, we've got a couple, we've got a couple of minutes left. Kate, before you go anywhere, I was just going to invite people in, like in 30 seconds. So this is the really difficult, really difficult bit. If there was one thing that you could change about the organization you want to partnership partner with so if there was one thing you wanted to be different with the schools that you want to work with or the the third sector organizations that you wanted to work with to give you a sense of ease in building partnership what would that be okay so for me it's not necessarily about the individual engagement but about the national conversation that we're having about access and social mobility because I think at the moment there are some quite damaging or potentially conflictory policy discussions that are happening with government in newspapers in certain areas that are kind of trying to create a battle between universities technical education providers and go, going and getting a job and I think actually that's just noise that is putting some people off from wanting to engage with us in all of our access work but also is stopping schools especially from being able to put resources in place to be able to have a full spectrum conversation about all of the potential opportunities their students have going forward um, and for me that's the biggest barrier actually is is making sure that the the narrative is right that's great thank you I'm gonna I'm gonna do a quick fire round kind of round the room Juliet can I come to you next yes okay so I'm not actually about working with Villiers Park, but in terms of universities, I would like um, more training, kind of 
more kind of open access and knowing how to um, build those links more readily. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Carl, would you like to come in? You don't get yeah. to respond to what Juliet said. You just get to say what you want from one of your partners. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. Um, I think from my point of view, I would, if I had a magic wand, I would want uh, the long term uh, vision that sits outside the political sphere so that we're able to actually meaningfully engage in work that doesn't all of a sudden change as a result of either uh, elections or change in personnel. Um, and we're actually able to fully evaluate that work after a period of time. So that would be my desire if I had one. That's the dream, man. This is honestly, we're building a utopia here. This is just delicious. Um, David, what would you, what would you be your one ask? It picks up a bit on what Kate said. It is about the narrative. It's about working with universities to set that that narrative. And unfortunately, at the moment, I think the narrative is the university isn't for everyone. And actually, that's wrong. It isn't necessarily the right route for everyone, but everyone should have the opportunity to pursue that if that's what they want to do. So I think some work al along that would be really brilliant. That sounds that sounds great. I couldn't agree more. Um, Laura, I'm going to let you uh, wrap us up. Thanks, Ray. If I had a magic wand, I'd give schools more time. Um, and that's impossible. I can't actually do that. <laughs> so I think what I would uh, like us to be able to do is uh, to create something that made schools be able to make quick decisions on what's going to work right for their students so if we could create a matrix of outcomes for young people that means that if schools know that they've got a particular cohort that are in the oh my god I've got no idea what to do with my life category this is the type of intervention that will work for them if I've got a bunch of students that are absolutely nailed on want to become doctors and be happy about it then this is the intervention that's going to support them and it means that they would be able to to not necessarily gain more time but make decisions quicker but, and uh, more accurately for their for their students that sounds like an absolute gift I've I love it. Proper love it. Thank you <laughs> so much. That was really interesting. And, and unsurprisingly, all of you, wisdoms and insights that I wasn't expecting, but it totally makes sense to me now. Um, and, and that I agree with, you know, in spades. So thank you so much for joining us um, today and, and sharing your thoughts and perspectives. I'm going to hand back over to Julian now so that everybody else gets a chance to uh, chuck in their two pennies worth. That's great, thanks Ray. Um, we've got about 20 minutes and um, as Ray said, you know, we've got a, a virtual room full of brilliant brains and experience and it seems like a missed opportunity not to try and capture some of that. Um, so I have put a link up to a Jamboard. I'll, I'll put the Jamboard on screen for anyone that's not used one. So I, I am a bit obsessed by Jamboard, so I do uh, apologise for... Um, uh, right, hopefully you uh, now can, and can you see the Jamboard? Uh, no, now, just the top panel of it. Oh, yeah, that's better. All right, sorry. Okay, so is that filling up your whole screen big enough? Big enough. So um, what I've done is um, I've just, with a, having gone through the, the framework, um, <clears throat> there were kind of sort of themes that seem to come up as being problems and challenges. So we've got the kind of, you know, the, the, the gaps that we might want to solve. And I wondered if it was worth just spending sort of 10, 15 minutes uh, in, in a kind of as a, as a giant collaborative breakout to start putting some ideas down about how we might address some of those challenges. Um, so on the first um, the first page is um, a communication issue. And again, this is sort of reflecting on some of the things we talked about in the panel, was that um, there are a lot of brilliant opportunities and activities and programmes, um, but there, there may not be a kind of a, a, a all encompassing central point at which young people or schools or people advise them can find out about the opportunities. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about what kind of um, solutions we could in, put in place to make sure that everyone could access the solutions that were available. Uh, I'll go through all the questions and you can just jump on whichever um, one you, speaks to you most. Um, another thing that came out of the um, the framework discussions was a kind of mismatch between what schools might school partners might need at a particular point and what universities or third sector partners might have been offering at the same time and there seemed to be an opportunity to kind of bring the 
that they want uh, and, and the solution together. So are there any ways that we can make sure that people who offer programmes and activities understand what be, what uh, beneficiaries need or what students might need at a particular time and what's the most effective way of making that uh, information available? Um, again, this is a, a similar sort of issue and, and Laura, I was really taken with your discussion of um, uh, uh, being a, an organisation that recognises what it knows and what it doesn't and being completely open about um, seeking to you know work with partners who have the knowledge you need whether that's local knowledge or knowledge about particular careers and again it's the same sort of issue if we've got um, colleagues across the sector with particular information about career pathways about technical um, vocational qualifications etc and people want to access that information how do we catalog that information and how do people find out where they can get the knowledge that they need to build that kind of effective partnership um again we, we sort of talked at the beginning about the kind of this, this issue of timing and the fact that if you're outside of the school sector you may not always be aware of the optimum time for particular activities to have the most impact or you might schedule things at times that just don't work for school partners or or students so how can we sort of um make sure that we have that, that efficient scheduling across different partnerships um same question as the first one really is, is how do we make sure that different parts of the sector can find and access the information they need to best support the young people we work with um and then again you know this cropped up in the, the discussion as well you know how, how can we make sure that we get this longitudinal sustained development that allows programs and um, interventions to evolve and develop between the partnership so they keep fulfilling the, the needs of, of all the stakeholders and then yeah just any any ideas about how best to represent the framework any comments or suggestions um if you've not used Jamboard before the easiest way of doing it you can you can scroll between the pages using the arrow at the top um, and you just click on a post-it note type and then save it and then it appears on the the whiteboard and you just drag it around whatever and once we've collected some ideas we'll go away and we'll group them and, and consolidate them um, so if that's okay I shall just um, sort of one, one, wumble around and read out key points as they appear and just give you a bit of kind of quiet thinking time to start um, putting any solutions you can think of or comments, questions for uh, colleagues, uh, anything you want to, to populate these boards. So just find a question that resonates and um, use as many post-it notes as you'd like. It's all sustainable because they're not paper, so go to town. Um, so it's worth saying actually you, you're all anonymous you've been giving uh, you've been given an, on, an anonymous animal identity so anything you write uh, won't be attributed to you and it will be completely so please do um, just you know be honest and um, say what you think. Uh, while you're thinking actually the um the, the the discussion in the panel was really interesting um and it made me think of um one of those um you know those films where uh, a small human gets in a giant robot and is able to extend their capacities by using robot arms and that sort of thing so it struck me that's what partnership is isn't it and and david you spoke about reach and laurie you spoke about knowledge and it's um basically partnerships are like robot armor i've decided That's a fantastic Julian metaphor, if ever I heard one. So on this board, we have a scarlet letter, an A, which I kind of like. And I think a lot of the kind of the challenges that have been isolated in the framework are around um, working in a in a complex sort of system with multiple stakeholders and the challenges of, of finding or getting through to the people that you need to when you need them the partners that you need to kind of build those robot arms 
and um, I know um, I've, got, I've got some colleagues from UniConnect uh, partnerships here and obviously part of the role of UniConnect is to do that in a on a regional level and bring school university college partners together um, but I'm not aware of anything that works like that on a national level so that's great so in terms of the content matching um, we have a suggestion that we we look at a 360 design approach so we include partners in as much of the development phase as possible so when we've got concepts, we work with partners at that stage to, to kind of flesh it out um, from the beginning with as many stakeholder needs as possible in mind, which sounds like a good idea. And yeah, really important that that could include student voice and the, you know, the beneficiaries that we're working with or the students that we're working with as well. Um, and you know, it's, it's welcome that we're increasingly um, looking for opportunities to bring in um, student voice in, into what we do across the sector. That's uh, an interesting um, bit of local context there. So um, Sussex has a, a LEP, a secondary school board and FE consortium, and um, they use that as a platform or a point of contact to sort of, I guess, sense check needs and to agree common needs. So that's an effective kind of partnership working to sense check. Uh, and it broadens out the, the perspectives involved. Um, another suggestion that we include stakeholders from the start and in the design and development of interventions. And I think that, that sort of came through in the discussions around the framework in the sense that different partners were offering different partners what they thought they wanted rather than what those partners actually wanted. So having that discussion early on to make sure that the offer meets the needs and requirements uh, can help pinpoint uh, and target the needs they're addressing. In terms of um, communication, uh, how can we assume that information opportunity is available to those who most benefit from it? Um, I really like the idea of a Netflix style people, you know, algorithm, people who like this also like this, sent to all the schools in a programme um, so that um, you can, um, in the communications, uh, a school or a program gets to hear about opportunities in, in other um, programs as well. And that sort of suggests partnership working across the third sector, across universities to, to kind of um, uh, raise awareness of linked and relevant activities. That sounds like a great idea. Um, so uh, build partnerships with schools, local partners, heads, SLT teams, careers and enterprise partnerships uh, and programmes uh, that benefit learners. Um, and also, uh, yeah, a really important point is, is not, I guess, I guess the point is not trying to kind of blag it and say that you've got expertise when you haven't been upfront and open about what the offer is, what you can offer. Um, and then going back to the Netflix style thing, perhaps referring to other colleagues who you know can can meet a need or you know for areas that we're not we don't have the expertise or knowledge in uh, really um useful um uh, comment there about um emails getting lost in the school system and i think that probably it works in other directions as well you know one of the the comments from partners who work in universities is it's often quite difficult to um, find the right people to contact or to make sure that the email gets through to them and I, I think that goes the other way as well and um, there was a, a particular discussion in on the, the, the session last time around um, identifying subject specific experts so if you want to run an intervention around biology say how do you get into schools and reach the people with the the kind of you know the, the biology focus or the science focus who know the students that would most benefit from them so it's a kind of interface of putting the right people in touch with each other um one-stop shop approach via UCAS um so that's a kind of UCAS as the the central point of information uh, and sharing and um got the UniConnect, uh, which aims to provide strategic outreach and signposting through local partnership hubs, um, works with local partner schools and colleges, but opportunities may be very highly targeted. Um, so I'm imagining that, is that something specific about the nature of the UniConnect partnership and the fact that UniConnect partnerships have a particular cohort of students they work with. So it's a kind of, it's a filter for 
um, the people that are the, the young people who meet the targeting criteria and there will be a whole cohort of other students who could benefit who may be missed out perhaps um, so that's an interesting suggestion about using TASO the um, oh, I can never get this acronym right the Centre for Achieving success. Um, it's the, the transforming, transforming access and student outcomes. Brilliant, thank you. I always get it wrong. Um, I think there's a few. Um, so it's using the, the TASO as a, a national WP sector oversight organisation um, or utilising relationships between regional Uni Connect partnerships as well. And again, that's a, a kind of is there a central point or a central hub that we can use to facilitate this sharing of information and, and sort of almost be a one stop shop for partners to to um, find the opportunities that are available. Um, so uh, and then as a kind of knowledge matching challenge as well, how can we match the people with the expertise and the experience with the people who need the expertise and experience when they need it. And again, you know, another big up for Tezo. Um, who may be able to help with this. It, it's the, the aim of the, the centre is to disseminate what works. Um, and it, you know, it will give them a privileged insight into the sector, particularly the university sector, I guess, to understand what, you know, what providers are working on um, and have expert expertise in. And it's something the IFS may help as well. So it's kind of a, the need for a brokerage system between knowledge and knowledge needs. Um, yeah, no, that's uh, someone after Moan Heart. Um, sessions like these are great for knowledge exchange. Embrace digital. Oh, yes. Um, send down recordings um, as if, uh, if you don't, uh, if you didn't make it because it's not because you're not interested. Yes, the problems of sort of synchronous delivery and getting a time that works for people. Um, just to say that we will be uh, making the recording for today's session available. And um, we might cut out some of my waffling, um, but it will be available to people who aren't able to make the session today. Um, better connectivity to academic researchers who are doing some excellent insightful work, but are not always great at communicating the policy practical implications of key, key findings. Yeah, that's that's a different <clears throat> it's a different part of the sector, isn't it? That you know people might be lucky enough to have links into, but the academic sector may have a tendency to speak to itself rather than to unless it's part of a project to make sure that the um their work and their thinking has um can have practical implications as well so i think that's yeah keep keeping um keeping tabs on um the people doing the, the relevant work that's a, that's a really good uh useful implementable hint i think and we ask partners we work with to create a wish list for us and then rag rate it, so we know what to prioritise and um, we can then act as an intermediary to deliver the expertise if we have the resource. So that's a really useful um, strategic approach to um, prioritising uh, needs and deciding where you, uh, a partner can add most value. Okay, uh, and not a solution, but a, a reflection and, and possibly a plea. Um, avoid meetings for the sake of meetings, which will mean people don't engage and therefore less likely to be able to gain an accurate picture of knowledge and needs. So that's presumably, is that a, a sort of suggestion that we, we find a way of um, sharing information that doesn't involve, um, you know, a full meeting, we might want to chunk information down and make it available in other, um, other formats. Um, yeah, there's, um, in terms of the um, linking delivery with requirements and timing, sharing the calendars at the beginning of each academic year between partnerships, I guess there are kind of digital tools as well that might help with that. Um, I think it, possibly it might be a case of um, different partners sharing expertise and experiences as well about what, the, what they've done and what works when. So, you know, we... We, for example, you, know, you might say that we had a particular success in scheduling a type of intervention at a particular point in the year, and the feedback was that it plugged into curriculum work that schools were doing, or vice versa. So, yeah. Um, yeah, sharing information on key dates. Um, schools uh, advise when they want things as early as possible. And this goes back to that suggestion that we where possible, we try and work on a yearly calendar so we schedule as much as possible. 
um, yeah, the importance of, of planning and, and communications. Um, yeah, it's. It, I mean, that's. A, I think it's probably a challenge for all of us, given the the kind of the the pace of of work and, and life. But that carving out time to get as much prep done as early as possible, um, to to get us ready to hit the ground running uh, in September. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Again, it's a kind of potential of a digital solution. How do we share information? Um, doesn't rely on emails, uh, maybe a web forum with opportunities, something like unitastedays.com, which I'm not familiar with. Um, I don't know if that's, that presumably is where universities can advertise um, open days and campus visits and stuff. Um, so yeah, some kind of online uh, resource where people can post um, either needs or, or offers. Uh, that's interesting. So um, avoiding duplication. There's nothing worse than students being swamped by the same thing and not being able to filter things out or know which resource to trust. So that's, you know, on those occasions when there are a whole bunch of things happening at the same time and they look similar, young people and schools will have a limited amount of resource. So it's that, I guess, choosing the, the right solution. Um, okay, I'll just quickly go through these and then we can go to the, the kind of um, wrap up and, and closing. Um, reflection. So, um, support long so how do we support longitudinal development and evolution? Engagement with parents is important. Um, having a shared narrative goal of social mobility between schools and FEHE. Yes, currently we have different data on monitoring, which is not shared between different sectors and different definitions of, say, disadvantage and so on. And that, you know, that, that cropped up in the, the framework as well, that we're all being held accountable to different performance measures and different kinds of things and there's a lack of joined upness across the sector um, okay uh, yeah working with parents is key informing and supporting them in their knowledge so they can support their children also know who to contact for carers and questions I think that kind of I guess a, a, co a group that may have been overlooked in the past and is now coming into visibility is working with parents and families as well to make sure that there's the kind of uh, a fully rounded um, set of information going out. So um, um, the, the Jamboard will uh, remain open. So please do keep jotting things down. Um, before the next workshop, um, and we'll, we, we'll be in touch with the date, um, we'll reflect back and, and group many of these points um, so that we've got a kind of uh, an extension of the, the kind of framework developing. Uh, as uh, I mentioned before, if um, you have any thoughts or ideas, please just do, please do just contact uh, me or, or Ray or, and um, uh, send your suggestions through. Um, a, a good reflection to go go gadget armchair. Thanks, Laura. Uh, um, Ray. Uh, I, think I, get, I get the opportunity to do a little bit of summing up gosh do you know what i was thinking like, partly that my head feels like it's about to explode but this was almost definitely and without a doubt the best hour and a half i think i've managed to spend um certainly all day but but possibly um all week and it's only tuesday but but let's not dwell on that too much really really uh considered responses from everybody thank you so much for uh for engaging um, and I was trying to I was trying to pull out what were the themes that I'd heard through the discussions and it, it sounds sounds to me like and I think that when we do some further analysis of people's responses, but it, it seems to me like one of the things that almost everybody has mentioned in one way or another is the huge importance of community of being embedded in the communities in which you're working, and that we might look to engage with partners who aren't community based, and they bring in tools or knowledge and skills that we can use but unless you are engaging you know unless there is community engagement at some point in that process then it then it really doesn't do the things that, that we need it to do so I think the focus on community was really useful for me um, I heard lots of people talk about the value of long-term relationships and that's about staff being in post long enough to build relationships um, with 
with other organizations, but also long term relationships being about organizational relationships. So, so that those interactions are in the bones of the ways in which organizations work, whether that's school strategies or university strategies or third sector strategies. It's about but this is the way we work. We work in a way that, that delivers partnership. Um, I think that there was some interesting comments there about the slowing of policy, <coughs> policy change, which lends to both of those things that I've already talked about. It's that when there's a new initiative every five minutes and a new focus, that it, it does damage to the partnerships that we're, we're establishing. And so creating space for partnerships to kind of really meld together um, and flourish means that we need to slow down some of that quick paced change. Um, and then the last bit was around conducive narrative um, and the need to have conversations with, with young people and to have the, the general kind of mood that's happening um, needs to be tweaked away from this, um, this kind of zero sum game stuff about who should and shouldn't access different types of education and a bit of a you get one chance at this and if you screw it up then you're done and so you have to choose the right path for you and there's some weird stuff about class and whether you know different types of people should be going to different types of courses and none of that helps people make good decisions where they feel like they have agency and so creating narratives that help young people to really tune into what it is that they want to achieve and the different ways that they might do it and the possibilities that are available to them um, and making sure that those possibilities are available to everybody is really key to creating the environment in which all the things that we're doing um, are able to work effectively. I just wanted to touch very briefly on, on next steps. As I said, we are looking to hold a third event in this th series of three, um, we haven't confirmed a date yet because we are all being super flexible around uh, John Blake's diary and making sure that he's able to attend because otherwise it's gonna be, um, there's gonna be a period of about 20 minutes when nothing happens um, and that makes for really boring television. So we're not going to do that. Um, so we will, everybody who's engaged in this, this event and the last one will get sent, um, sent an email to let you know when the next event's happening and how you can engage in it. We're thinking about doing a slightly different format. So I think before the event, there'll be an opportunity for you to send in questions to ask John, um, and then we'll do some work behind the scenes so that we can cluster those and really have an opportunity to kind of scratch beneath the surface really of, of, of his thinking and, and in terms of challenges, his vision for the future and also what he thinks the solutions are. Um, and then the last thing I think that comes out of all this, which is by far the best bit, is that as a, as a collaboration between schools, FE colleges, universities and the third sector, we will have built a framework that articulates how we collectively as a partnership think partnership working um, could be done in a way that is effective, sustainable, robust and, and long term. And I'm really, really looking forward to getting to the end of this piece of work, not because I want it over and done with, um, but because I think having that available, making sure that we can really share that and we can consider that as we start to develop the work that all of us are doing um, over the coming months and years is going to be really, really valuable. I don't imagine for a second it will be a static piece of work. I think it's the kind of thing that once we've Put, it's kind of given it wings, shoved it out of the nest. Um, it, I'm hoping that it will fly and it will keep, we can keep adding to it um, and engaging with it in different ways so that we can make sure that those relationships and partnerships have the absolutely the best opportunity to succeed so that, you know, so that together in collaboration, we can make sure we are achieving the very best possible outcomes for the young people that we're all here um, to serve. I'm going to wrap it up there. I just want to thank my panel again so much um, for, for your really considered pearls of wisdom, um, both in terms of your introductions, but also your really quick and yet so insightful answers to my selection of random questions. It was hugely, hugely interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if people wanted to chat about anything that we're doing on this project or anything else that we're doing at the moment, then by all means, um, as Julian says, drop Julian uh, or me um, an email or a tweet or a message. We're relatively easy to get hold of. 
and we'd really like to talk to you about that a little bit more. Hopefully, um, I'll see you all back here in a few weeks to, to talk all things policy and partnership. Um, it's going to be an interesting one. Um, and in the meantime, enjoy your evenings. There's a bit of sunshine left. Go and uh, have a cup of tea in the garden or walk the dog or watch some Netflix, whatever it is that you need to do to unwind because we'll be cracking on again in the morning. Thank you so much. Take care.